那 Chad Arimura 是 Oracle Java Developer Relations 的 VP， 然后，嗯，他拥有超过二十年。的领导技术团队跟软体建构的经验，那目前是 Iron I O 的 C E O 级创始人之一。他带领公司开拓了数百万美元的 A R R 业务，并且成为开拓无服务器计算的先驱。那今天的主题主要是在讲在呃 Java Platform 在 Java 8以后的一些创新技术。对 ，So without further ado, you can start your session. Okay. Hello. Uh, let me try and share my screen. Perfect. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I have Tony Chen back channeling in Slack in case there are any issues. Um, but thank you for having me. I am sorry that I can't be there in person. Uh, travel is restricted right now. But seeing all of you in the room up there is making me very jealous. Uh, I wish I could be there uh, in person to present again. Um, so today's talk in about 30 minutes, uh, I should actually start a uh, timer, how's that? It, today's talk is um, about Java and at 25 years old. Um, so it's a very exciting quarter century birthday right now. Um, as um, the host mentioned, my name is Chad Arimira and I run the developer relations team for the Java platform group at Oracle. Um, so, we chose a theme this year called Our World Moved by Java. Java is truly a global phenomenon. Um, in the quarter century that it's been around, it truly does move the world forward uh, on a global level. Um, and by many statistics, it is the number one programming language in the world. Um, over 70% or almost 70% of developers run Java, uh, 50 billion active JVMs today. Uh, and if you look at the statistic on the right, I actually did a survey of the top 100 companies in the United States, and 98% of them are running Java based off their hiring. Um, so it is truly, truly a phenomenon uh, that uh, Java has, has become such a global powerhouse for a language. Um, and this is because we've really spent um, you know, uh, many years on a relentless pursuit for developer productivity for you as a developer and the performance of your applications. And as you can imagine, over 25 years, many things change. Programming fashions change, the paradigms change, the styles change, the hardware changes, the deployment models change. And a programming language as a platform has to evolve with those changes. Uh, but there's a constant tension between conservatism, which is move slower and don't break things, and more change, which is move faster because we need new features and we need to solve more and newer problems. And this is the thoughtful approach that the language architects that work on Java spend so much time thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis because Java is not just something for today, but it's for the next quarter century as well. If we take a quick look back, over the past 20 years, We've released Java on a release cadence of every two, three, four, sometimes five years. That means between versions, there were many years that went by before you saw new features. This may have worked because, you know, traditionally back in the early 2000s, applications took you know, sometimes multiple years to um, to deploy new versions. It was the waterfall method, and it could take a whole long time. You might ship code every year. And so it was fine for a programming language to move at that pace. Um, but now there's a demand um, because applications are being deployed sometimes daily. And so for a programming language not to change for every couple of years is simply unacceptable. So this is where, you know, we continue to think about innovation and conservation, and we have evolved the release cadence of Java to be a time-based release cadence every six months. So now a new version of Java is released every six months like clockwork in September and March. Starting with Java 10, um, we have released now six versions of Java under this new release cadence, and we have a seventh one planned uh, for March of 2021 with Java 16. This has worked tremendously well. 
Um, the community has embraced this new release cadence and we're able to get new features in the hands of developers um, much quicker. And what's ready to go into a release goes, what's not ready waits for the next release. And the next release is just around the corner, so there's no rush to rush things into the language. But this doesn't mean that we suddenly created a ton of new ability to deliver uh, three years worth of work in six months. If you look at the JDK enhancement proposals, these are features of Java that have we have created. It's almost like an issue tracker. It's called a JEP or JDK enhancement proposal. Under the new release cadence, we have a much smaller number of JEPs that go into each release, meaning the release is much smaller than they were for Java 8 and Java 9 and previous. So upgrading from 9 to 10 to 11 to 12 is much different than upgrading from 6 to 7, from 7 to 8, from 8 to 9, et cetera. Um, and this was very much by design. So this is what Java 16 looks like. I'm going to talk about many of the new features today, uh, but I just want to give you a snapshot of what a, uh, of what a release looks like. Um, so we've got 13 JEPs in uh, Java 16. You can actually go and try these today by downloading the early access build of Java 16, which is coming in March, the GA version. And it's not just Oracle that works on these releases. There are many companies um, across the world that contribute to Java by way of the OpenJDK community. Uh, the OpenJDK project is where the actual Java code that powers the platform is written. Now, a majority of it does come from Oracle. We're the stewards, um, and we produce, uh, we build almost 80% of, of the, the platform, platform, if not more. But we have a very thriving and healthy ecosystem of other companies that care very much about the success and future of Java. So what goes into a release of Java? We don't just come up with these things randomly. You know, you know, like we don't go to a conference and someone says, I really want this feature. We run back and we, and we build it into the platform. You know, it's a very thoughtful approach because once something goes into Java, it's there for many, many years to come. So this is a grouping of projects that are aiming to solve problems on the long term. So challenges that developers have today and over the next couple of decades we think about these in groupings of projects. So for example, with Project Loom that I'll talk about, we're thinking about highly concurrent applications. With Project Valhalla, we're thinking about utilizing modern hardware because hardware has changed a lot in the last 25 years. Uh, and so each of these projects is produce, producing innovation at different paces. Some of them have actually contributed into the language already, such as Project Amber and Project Loom. Um, and others are kind of earlier in that stage or in that phase. And I'll talk about some of these towards the end of the presentation. And of course, Java is not just a technical platform. It is also a powerful or an, a, a, a really thriving and vibrant community as well, an ecosystem. Oracle does continue to invest in many of the different resources that make the community what it is. Uh, and these are some of the channels that you can invest in your career as a developer. Um, we are working on many channels to improve the developer productivity and the awareness of the things going on in the platform. Um, you can see we have a YouTube page. We have inside.java, which is a place to find news about Java. Uh, we have the Inside Java podcast, which is a new podcast that we released uh, back in uh, just a couple months ago. We have our Twitter handle, uh, Twitter forward slash Java. Uh, and we have education.oracle.com where we released a new Oracle Learning Explorer where you can actually take free classes uh, to uh, level up your Java skills. And I'll actually send this presentation to everybody afterwards. So I'll try to so that you can have some of the links for these things. Okay, I'm going to shift gears uh, in the next 25 minutes or so. I'm going to talk about some of the new uh, features that have been released to Java. It's a bit of a whirlwind, so bear with me. And then I'm going to talk about some of those innovation projects that are thinking about tomorrow's challenges as well. Um, so if you're a developer and you're looking for new stuff, this should be a pretty, pretty exciting section here. Um, okay, let's start simple. Local variable type inference. Now this might seem very simple, but it's complex under the hood. 
Local variable type inference is all about reducing the boilerplate of code and making it easier to write, but also easier to read. Um, it makes it more expressive. So what we do with, uh, with local variable type inference, also known as var, is we can actually replace um, the declaration of the variable with the keyword var. So that might seem simple, but what this does is it makes our code more readable, more expressive, and it forces you to write code that has meaning. Because before we could get lazy and we could read the, uh, the declaration, now we're forced to actually name our variables something useful for somebody to read the code in the future because a variable is actually used many more times than the declaration of it uh, before. And so this, is, this actually makes code easier to read and it's, you know, the statistics show that code is writ, uh, read you know, at least five to, time ten, five to 10 times more than it's actually written. So you want to write code that's easy to read for future uh, developers. Oh, and there's a style guide that you can get at openjdk.java.net written by um, Stuart Marks, talks all about the style guide for using var, when to use it, when not to use it. And I'll send these links out. Text blocks is another uh, seemingly simple feature, but very powerful. And I'll actually, sh I'll show some code here. So this is, this is a pretty typical line of code or block of code. You know, if you're writing HTML, which many of us are, if you're writing SQL statements to talk to databases, many of us are, um, you'll have code that looks like this. What text blocks gives us is, uh, is a, a multi-line string literal. So we can actually transform this code into this. This is much prettier, much easier to write. Uh, I mean, this is just like, nobody wants to write this code. Um, this is actually what you wanted to write. And now we actually have new methods as well that enable us to inject variables into the string um, as part of the multi, uh, multi line string literal. So we can now write it like this. Um, along those same lines. Oh, actually one more thing to say, um, the, the compiler can actually detect white space that you didn't intend. So you might be thinking, what happens to all that white space? Is my ultimate output going to be really ugly because I've got a bunch of white space? We actually remove the unintended white space because we can detect where the multi-line, the string literal starts. Um, so there's a lot of power behind the scenes on what's going on. And feel free to ask questions as well. I think I have a Slido open, but someone may need to send me a question because I can't see it. Maybe Tony can slack me something. Um, so switch expressions. Now switch expressions are an extension of what were switch statements. And this is of course best uh, by showing code. Um, so if you can see here, this is a switch statement. It's pretty typical. We set a variable at the top. We then run through a bunch of cases. And based on those cases, we set the variable. If we didn't achieve uh, success in one of the cases, then we need to get exhaustiveness by having a default case and then we return that value. Most likely what the developer wanted to actually write here, what was in their head is something more like this. It's much shorter, much more expressive and much easier to read and much less uh, error prone. This is a switch expression. It's returning the value of the, what's on the right of the Lambda symbol as well. And that can actually be multiple lines where you can yield the value as well. So there's new functionality around a yield keyword. And in fact, if the uh, if the um, if we're switching across something that's exhaustive, like an enumerator, an enum, we can actually remove the default case as well. And now this is our switch expression. Again, these things are all um, designed to make it more expressive, to make it more fun to write Java, to write what you had originally thought of in your head the first time, as opposed to having to do something uh, uglier. And of course, these things all work very nicely together as I'll get to when I start talking about sealed classes in a bit. So the Z garbage collector, also known as ZGC or ZGC, is a garbage collector that, it, that aims to bring pause times down below 10 milliseconds. Um, if you've worked with GCs, GCs before, um, across pretty large heaps, you'll notice that, you know, sometimes the application can completely stop while it does garbage collection. In fact, the aim of ZGC is to bring the GC time or the garbage collection pause times down 
even below 10 milliseconds. We're seeing that it's between three and five milliseconds. And with concurrent thread process, uh, concurrent thread stack processing, we're seeing sub millisecond pause times. To give you an idea of what that looks like compared to the other GCs, by the way, G1 is still the default GC, um, which is the most broadest use case for a GC. Um, this is what pop, the, the lower the graph, the better. And ZGC is not zero, but there's actually some pause time there, but it's so little you can't see it on this graph. Um, so ZGC uh, actually can work across multi terabyte heaps. So think about big data, AI, ML, um, data science, these types of applications are, are perfectly um, suitable for ZGC. Okay, now a very, very uh, anticipated feature in Java is called records. And records are a class for essentially declaring um, transparent holders for immutable data. In other words, it's modeling data as data without the verbosity or the ceremony of a class of having to deal with like a full class. And again, showing code is, is the best. So here is a pretty straightforward class. It's a point class and you have X and Y class variables. Uh, and then you have a bunch of stuff in here that you probably don't necessarily want, but you had to write it anyways. Um, now think of this as it could potentially be a class that you persist to database. You can have hundreds of those. If you have hundreds of objects in your model or classes in your model, your domain. Um, and so multiply something like this by hundreds, if not thousands, that's what generally applications end up looking like two string hash code equals, uh, constructors, getters, all of these things are boilerplate records replaces all of that code with just one single line. It's more powerful than this, but the kind of base case of records uh, turns it into this. So suddenly we have the capability to reduce a ton of code and make your code about the data only. And so it's, it's much, much easier to write expressive code that doesn't have bugs or errors in it. Uh, there's a reason why we ran a competition for features across Twitter. Um, and if you don't follow our Twitter handle, it's twitter.com slash Java uh, or at Java. And uh, we ran this, I think, back in July and records made it to second place. So we took a bunch of features, everybody voted and they narrowed down into a winner. Records was number two. Uh, and there's a reason for that because there's a lot of power behind them. Um, this is a recent edition of records called local records. Um, and this is just an example of, you know, these are akin to local classes where we're using essentially a temporary record in the middle of a line, uh, a block of code to make it much easier to interact with the stream API. So in this case, we're creating a helper. I don't know if you can see my mouse. We're creating a helper record called merchant sales that takes a merchant and a double value um, and then uses that record inside the stream operation. And it's much, much cleaner than having to do it otherwise. Um, and so this is a local record, which is in the second preview of records today, I believe. A um, couple more features before moving to the project. So sealed classes. Again, this is a way to better model the domain that you're trying to model on your application. Um, Java, you know, is known for uh, its class hierarchy, its code reuse via inheritance. Um, however, you may not always want just code reuse. You may want uh, to model an existing domain that has just, you know, a known number of subclasses. In that case, you can seal a class. So we have a new modifier called sealed and a new um, permits clause. And I'll show um, some code for that. So sealed classes, you can restrict which classes and interfaces can extend and implement those. I see a couple questions. I'll, I'll answer those in just a, in just a bit. Well, why don't I just take a look? Let's see. Um, do we also consider val? I presume that that is considering uh, value types. Um, now, not today, but that's something that uh, Project Valhalla is is looking at and addressing. I actually don't talk about Project Valhalla today. Um, but it's definitely a project that you want to take a look at. It's a kind of a longer 
term project that um, is is not kind of on a short short time frame to to, to produce, um, but it's definitely one to follow because there's a ton of amazing work going into it. Uh, it said record is not suitable for JP Engine. Is it true? I don't know the answer to that one just yet. Um, ZGC production ready for Java 15. Do you consider backports Java 11? Um, you know, we've heard that before. Typically, we do not backport features into older releases. Um, I don't know if the community will will pr produce uh, produce a backported version of ZGC. Um, so we'll see. Most likely, uh, most likely not. But but who knows? You can watch the Open JDK project to see if if that's done. Um, okay. So sorry. Getting back to sealed classes. Um, Sealed classes, so here's an example. We have a class shape, and then we're going to seal it. And we're going to permit only a circle, rectangle, and square to, uh, to implement or uh, extend that, uh, the class shape. So then the um, subclass circle now can then, uh, we, we can actually classify that one of three ways. It can be final or it can be sealed itself, or it can be non-sealed. Um, and so in this case, we're extending shape with circle and we're, we're, we're marking it as final. Now for the rectangle, we're actually going to permit two subclasses itself. And so we're gonna make a transparent rectangle and a filled rectangle. Okay, we're gonna implement those. And then we're gonna have a non-sealed class called square um, where somebody can go and, and create subclasses of, of square and, or interfaces. Um, now, one of the beauties of sealed class is we now have exhaustiveness in a particular sealed class. And again, I mentioned earlier in switch expressions, if you have exhaustiveness, then you don't have to have the fall through case. And there's a lot of really cool things that the compiler can do and reason about if you know exactly um, what the subclasses are ahead of time. Um, so all of these things start to fit together in a very harmonious way. Again, the Java platform is not designed randomly. It all fits together very nicely into a cohesive story moving forward. It doesn't mean that, you know, we do the right thing every time, um, but in, in, in essence, it's a, you know, very harmonious system. And on that note, we have pattern matching, which is another seemingly simple feature, but it's very powerful. Um, so what pattern matching is, is it takes a very uh, common, um, a common block of code, which really does three things. It uh, runs a test, whether object is a string. And if it is, then we're gonna cast it into the variable S um, and what well, we're gonna declare the variable and then we're gonna pass it into uh, into variable s. So I'm sure we've done this, you know, a thousand times in our own code, uh, but this can be simpler because there's lots of bugs that can hide in here. Casting is generally can be um, a, an error prone way of programming. With pattern matching, for instance, of we can now write all of those uh, tests, all of those operations in one line of code. So if the object is a string, then we're going to create a string s and we're going to assign the object to s and we can use it inside inside the uh, block of code here and the logic goes that if we don't have uh if object is not a string then we don't get s and it's out of scope in this block and that actually holds true for conditionals as well so in this case s is in scope because you can notice we're using the and operand and it can be true or false on the left and we won't actually um, we won't actually interpret the code to the right of the end operator, and this line should work. But in this case, it will not work because, as you probably know, the or you have to check both sides of the or statement. But s may not be defined here. So again, we get a compiler error, uh, cannot find the symbol. So anyway, the logic works for pattern matching like that. Uh, a couple other features, um, foreign memory access API is a safe alternative to nio.bytebuffer and sun.misc.unsafe. Um, and, you know, this may not be very common for people to use, um, but it's very, very interesting. It's part of Project Panama, which I'll talk about in a bit, that aims at uh, making Java more accessible for native code. 
uh, like code written in C or C++, uh, primarily around the um, uh, AI ML space. And so foreign memory access API is part of that. And this is to access um, memory off the heap. Uh, if you're not using Flight Recorder, use it. Um, it's meant to be used in production. It's very, very, very low overhead, and it gives you a ton of data about your running applications. Uh, in 14, JDK 14, we added streaming of Flight Recorder data so you can stream it to any service that can then read it and produce results. So if you're running applications in production, you should be using uh, Java Flight Recorder or JDK Flight Recorder. And last but not least, the dark horse of the competition, we didn't think that null pointer exceptions would be so popular in the uh, competition we ran in July. It was. Um, apparently, a lot of developers have a lot of pain over null pointer exceptions. You've probably seen this before. That line of code is pretty simple, but if you have a null pointer, you don't know whether it's A or it's B. What helpful null pointer exceptions give us is additional information about which uh, part of the expression or which part of the code uh, actually produced the null pointer or which object was null ultimately. Um, and so this, uh, this is off by default until JDK 15 and the, now it is on by default. So very, very exciting. A lot of people thought it was really exciting. Um, okay. I have just under 10 minutes and uh, with Project Loom. So Project Loom is quite uh, an anticipated project. And the reason is that most developers who have dealt with threads in Java um, don't come away extremely ecstatic about them. Uh, threads tend to be a pretty big bottleneck because they're heavy. Um, and so if you have an application that requires a lot of throughput, uh, then Threads can oftentimes be the bottleneck for you. Um, so just a little bit about threads. Um, they're RAM heavy. They have to task switch to the kernel. Um, and remember, operating system threads have to deal with every programming language that's running on that machine. And so there's a lot of compromises that it makes. It has to kind of be a catch-all for everything. And so um, they're very heavy and they're very, they're very costly. Um, so our implementation of that is java.lang.thread, and that's been throughout the history of Java. Um, so what, um, what Project Loom aims to do, oh, and many developers are, need to make a decision at that point. If they need to scale their application, they have to choose between synchronous code and asynchronous. Synchronous is your typical program. It's easy to read. It, the entire Java platform is sort of built around synchronous, writing synchronous code. So the debuggers, the profilers, the exception handling, the control flow, all of that stuff is built around understanding threads in a synchronous model. Um, unfortunately, because threads are expensive, then the hardware is not happy. So the programmer is happy because it's much simpler and you know everything around the platform, all the tooling and everything works as you would expect, but the programmer is, uh, but the hardware is unhappy. So a lot of developers have turned to asynchronous programming. Asynchronous programming is very scalable, but it's the complete opposite when it comes to programmer happiness because it's hard to read, it's hard to debug, it's hard to profile, um, and it's hard to migrate as well from platform to platform. So the hardware might be happy and your application might be uh, faster, but the programmer is not happy. That's what we've seen typically. So Project Loom aims to give you the best of both worlds by introducing something called virtual threads. Virtual threads are um, much lighter weight threads that run on top of carrier threads or carrier are the platform threads and the system actually takes care of the scheduling for you. You can actually change the scheduler yourself, but very few people will actually need to do that. That's something that no other language actually does. I think Go routines, you can't do that. Um, and so it's very unique to, uh, to, to Project Loom and virtual threads. Um, so they're extremely lightweight, whereas you might be able to spin up a couple thousand threads you can spin up literally millions of virtual threads. And so this will increase the throughput of your application significantly. And so it codes like sync, 
but it scales like async and everybody and everything is a smiley face. Now, Project Loom is being actively developed. Um, it has produced some uh, JEPs or some uh, code to the latest JDK. Um, however, it hasn't been released yet. There are early access builds that you can access um, of Project Loom. Um, and I can follow up with links to that as well, but you can find them pretty easily. Um, and you might ask, when's it going to be ready? And the answer is, we don't know when it's ready. But directly from the uh, project lead for Project Loom, we're getting close. So I'll leave it at that. I'm paraphrasing him. So if he sees this, I'm sorry. Okay, Project Panama. Um, these are the last couple slides in the five minutes that I have. Um, Project Panama, as I mentioned earlier, is all about making Java uh, easier to, to interact with native code. And when I say native code, I'm talking about C or C++, the native code that runs on the platform itself. Um, what you may not know is most AI and ML code is actually written in native code. Um, Python did a really fantastic job of wrapping, making it simple to wrap that, AI, that native code um, and exposing that to developers to use. And that's great that Python did that, but Python is not the magic uh, wand that you may think it is for AI and ML. So Java wants to make it much easier as well to interact with a lot of that code that you may need to do AI ML um, on, on modern hardware. Panama is all about uh, making that happen. So there's a couple uh, releases or JEPs that are available to try out today. I talked about the Foreign Memory Access API. Um, there's a tool called the J Extract tool or the Extraction tool, which takes the C headers and it turns that into a, a Java code that you can access, basically a Java API. Um, and so if you think of that as a JNI replacement or Java native interface, if you've used JNI before, um, it's a pretty painful experience that's been around for a long time. Um, these tools help replace that. Uh, the Vector API, there's an entire podcast on our, uh, that just got released on the Vector API. Um, this is part of it because it's all kind of running in the same category of um, doing amazing things across modern hardware. So the Vector API is about expressing vector computations uh, across the hardware at runtime. Um, and so that's definitely something to, to take a look at, and that's part of Project Panama as well. Um, okay, last but not least, packaging and deployment. Um, if you have a Java application and you need to deploy it, uh, there's a couple different models you can do that. Of course, you can use containers, you can use servers, um, and you can use the cloud. Uh, you can also deploy a Java application really easy to the client as well. Um, so packaging and deployment is, is part of that story. Um, with Java 9, we released the modularity system. And the modularity system uh, was a pretty amazing move forward for the JDK. Um, and you can actually, so your application may only need a very small piece of the JDK. Um, so here are a couple modules that you may need. Each of those modules has some dependencies. We can now wrap those up into a, a self-contained application with a custom runtime of the JDK, uh, Java Development Kit, and your application. And your runtime is now have gone from 300 megs down to about 30. That's just you know a random example here. Um, your mileage may vary. Now I have an, a much smaller um, instantiation of my application that I can use in a serverless environment or in containers, uh, et cetera. I may also want to deploy that to the desktop so I can create a, uh, I, I can use the JLink tool to create that custom runtime. And then I can execute my application using that runtime. Um, and I can, inc I can combine that with a Java packager, which takes that, uh, that self-contained Java application and it builds a native application to deploy to a system like a Mac or Linux or Windows. So it actually builds a Debian file or a DMG file or an executable exe or MSI, uh, et cetera. So um, that's part of the deployment uh, strategy for uh, Java. Um, and so the, the end result is you have a much, much smaller uh, implementation of your application. And so uh, with that, I think that is everything. 
uh, in my presentation. I, I want to thank you very much for taking time. I see a couple questions, so I will try and get to those. Uh, but I really appreciate you, um, you know, letting me present from across the world. Uh, and uh, thank you for making the journey of Java a successful one for the past however many years you've been a Java programmer. And if you haven't, hopefully I've convinced you to try it. So let's see, let me just look through some of the questions. Um, are there any drawbacks or things we should consider when using virtual threads? Okay, drawbacks to virtual threads. Um, honestly, not many. Um, I think it's still early. So there are still some, uh, there are still some uh, bugs that are hiding inside Project Loom. So I wouldn't encourage you to use it in production, but we absolutely would love feedback if you can use an early access build, I think it's getting close. In fact, they think it's getting close, but we could use edge cases, et cetera. Um, there's not really, I can't think of any drawbacks um, because the programming model for Loom, for Loom, for virtual threads is very straightforward. I actually didn't include code on it. I should have, um, but I apologize for that. It's very, very easy to get started um, and to spin up virtual threads. Um, so, I can't think of any drawbacks at this time. Um, is ZGC suitable for smaller applications who want steady, low latency transaction backend API? Um, the answer to that is is I don't I don't know. So your your mileage may vary, um, and I'm not a uh, garbage uh, ZGC expert. Um, I can uh, I can say that. The reason that we provide multiple GCs and that ZGC has not become the standard GC yet is that there are, you know, it depends on your use case and your particular application for which garbage collector to choose for your standard garbage collector. Um, ZGC, I would say, is absolutely one that you should try out for, for low latency transactions. Um, I would definitely try it out, but your mileage may vary because oftentimes a kind of general broad usage can be better with uh, with G1. Um, so that's something to uh, to keep in mind. Um, keyword with hyphen is weird. I mean, non-sealed. Yes, that is probably true. Um, I can say that uh, the language designers and architects put an incredible amount of time into thinking about small details like that. Um, so I don't know the specifics around choosing non-sealed, but uh, believe me, one example is Project Loom started as fibers, um, but there was too much of a disconnect between the concept of fibers and threads, and so they changed it to virtual threads. I didn't like virtual threads as much, but now that I've been talking about it more and using it, it makes so much more sense. So. A lot of times, you know, you just have to trust them. Um, but feedback is always welcome. So project aims to replace programming with JNI. Panama, uh, yes. Yes, it absolutely aims to replace uh, JNI. And the JExtract tool is available today if you want to try it out. Uh, running Java on Apple Silicon. Good question. Uh, there's actually a, I believe there's a JEP already open to discuss a port of Java on Apple Silicon. And you, and you can imagine we're, we're, we've been thinking about this for, for some time. You know, we generally have early access to all of this stuff. I mean, we're working on platforms well ahead of time. Um, so absolutely, there will be, there will, it will be running on, on Apple Silicon. If you go to open, the open JDK site, I believe there's a JEP that talks about this. Um, is there a plan to improve support for container? Hey, by the way, thanks for all the questions. Normally don't get all these questions. This might be a fun platform. Uh, is there a plan to improve support for container environment, um, such as zero copy, NIO zero copy? So um, I'm not familiar with NIO zero copy, um, but for, for containers, um, absolutely. So if you look at... What's not captured in some of the JEPs, there are thousands of um, what we call uh, bug tracker issues that are also mostly publicly available. 
that you can view um, on at our bug tracker. I forget the exact URL, but um, and many of those are around smaller changes, so simple things that make you know Java run better in containers. So if you look at Java eight through fifteen. Every single release has done stuff to make Java better inside of containers. Um, so if you go back to, I forget it was around seven or, or eight, maybe even nine, um, Java wasn't even aware of the container memory limit. And so it would just kind of use whatever memory or CPU it could. Um, but we, of course, fixed that a long time ago. But those types of things are getting, are getting better. Um, serial classes, the drawback of this feature might be to increase the dependency on the super class to subclass. Um, that could be a drawback. I don't have a great answer to that. Um, I think the intention of sealed classes is not to use them all the time, but use them when it makes sense, when you know exactly what the subclasses are. And so that's kind of an intended uh, side effect of, of sealed classes is to increase the dependency. I think that's all the questions, um, unless there are any others that, am I missing any? I'm just kind of scanning here. I think that's everything. Okay, I think that's everything. I, I really appreciate everybody um, spending the time with me and allowing me to present uh, across the world. Um, I will send this presentation um, so that you can get a copy of it with all the links. Um, and, you know, do come check us out. You know, my team manages inside.java, the inside Java podcast, the uh, Java Twitter handle, and the Java YouTube channel. These are all channels where we work closely with the team that's building Java to continue to educate the market on the things that are going on, ultimately making you better developers and better programmers. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining with us. Okay, bye. <laughs> bye, thank you.